You know, it's hard to know where to even start. For those of you who don't know, uh, don't recognize her, that was Eve Ensler, and that was the, uh, the opening of her keynote speech uh, at the NOW conference, which I attended last month. And uh, like I said, it's hard to know where to begin. I was sort of sitting there the whole time, uh, <laughs> feeling like I was having an out-of-body experience, or I'd been abducted by aliens, or something. I just, I, I, where am I? Who are these people? I just want to go home. Um, and and really, as far as uh, as vaginas go, I, I don't know that I have ever heard that word uttered so many times in so short a period in my life. I think her 30-minute speech might rival a gynecology textbook as far as uh, mentions of vaginas go. And at one point, uh, she even came out and said that she she knows with her vagina. She knows in her vagina. Don't believe me? Here you go. And I'm going to tell you something deep in my soul, in my heart, in my vagina. I know the women's spring is here. I guess this might be one of those uh, women's ways of knowing things that uh, gets discussed a lot in feminist ethics circles. Um, later on, she, she drops uh, this lovely bomb. And you would maybe even worship their vaginas! Which uh, made me raise my eyebrows just a little bit. So there I am, in a room full of cheering, applauding women, wondering what planet am I even on? Are these grown women? I... Anyway. She started off by showing us a video of herself giving a speech on the steps of Congress in Lansing, Michigan. Um, because who doesn't love seeing oneself on a video bellowing the word vagina repeatedly in front of an adoring crowd? Um, her trip to Lansing uh, coincided, uh, it was, it was uh, brought about by uh, a Congress, uh, a, a representative being censured by Congress there, uh, as feminists would have you believe, for uttering, daring to utter the word vagina. Now, considering that vagina is clearly a word that can be uttered in uh, any Congress or state legislature, um, one example being the transvaginal ultrasound that gets discussed a lot, um, I, I, I think it's, it's really misleading uh, for them to be making a big deal out of this and pretending like it's uh, as if the objections to what uh, that politician said w was uh, was just objections to hearing the word vagina. What this woman actually said was, Mr. Speaker, I'm flattered you're so interested in my vagina, but no means no. So when you take it in context, uh, the sexual innu innuendo there, the hints of, uh, of the speaker uh, being a predatory male uh, interested in this particular woman's vagina, it, it's just, it's ridiculous to say that, that it's simply the word vagina that these, these politicians were objecting to. Um, <clears throat> and after we watched that video, uh, which, which was kind of... Uh, 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 we got down, she got down to the nitty-gritty. And uh, the nitty-gritty uh, was, of course, rape. Uh, because with Eve, you know it's going to either be vaginas or rape or both. Uh, her entire speech uh, from that point on was a pay to female victimhood, a celebration of all the ways women, and women alone, are subjugated and subordinated and disempowered by society. Now, I'm going to link to the video of her speech in the low bar uh, for any of you who have the intestinal fortitude to sit through it. Um, I, I'm going to ask that you, you just resist uh, the temptation to comment on Nell's channel. It's not going to do any good anyway. Um, and, and really, they're, all they're going to do is censor it. Um, so, there you go. 
Uh, for anyone who doesn't feel they can stomach 37 minutes of vaginas and rape, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a summary. About midway through, Eve shared the story of Jean, a woman in the Congo who'd been the victim of rape as a weapon of war and economic conquest. If Jean had a husband or a brother or son or any males in her life, uh, we, we don't hear about them. Uh, her village was attacked by militants, and she'd been raped. Uh, she sought help for her injuries at an NGO active in the area, and received surgery and treatment, after which she returned to her village, only to be tied to a tree by these militants and repeatedly raped for a period of two months. When she was released, she found her way to another NGO and received nine surgeries to repair the damage to her body. It was then that Ensler, uh, founder of the $85 million V-Day charity, found her recovering from her surgeries and her trauma and asked her what it was that she wanted. What do you want? What do you need? What this woman, Jean, wanted was a village where women and girls could be safe from violence. Uh, this village, City of Joy, was built in part uh, by Eve Ensler's charity. It was outfitted by Google with computers and internet. Uh, it's a place where women and girls can be safe and, uh, and heal, learn and grow, and become empowered. In Eve Ensler's words, uh, become the future leaders of the DRC. And I just want to make it clear, I, I have a huge amount of sympathy for that woman. Um, I, I would have a huge amount of sympathy for anyone who had suffered the things that she's suffered. Uh, it, it, it just it disgusts and sickens me when I think of what human beings can do to each other. And uh, if I hadn't swallowed a red pill a long time ago, I'd have probably been thinking exactly what every other room, a woman in that room was thinking. Um, as it was, knowing what I know about such things, all I could really think as Eve was talking about the plight of women in the Congo was, if it's that bad for women and girls, I can't even imagine how it must be for men and boys. There aren't a whole lot of uh, mainstream venues discussing male victims of wartime sexual violence, uh, but I did stumble across a recent documentary on BBC Radio, and I've collected a few other sources uh, that I will link in the low bar. Uh, a lot of them have to do with uh, not sexual violence against men, but uh, gender violence in the sense of uh, men being the primary targets of any kind of genocidal uh, violence that tends to happen around the world, all, from Kosovo to, uh, to Russia, you know, during World War II. Um, it, it really is uh, mainly men who are targeted for that kind of thing. As, uh, as one re researcher uh, said, basically, uh, in his researches, uh, he's found that brutal societies are brutal to both men and women, and that any society where rape of women is an arbitrary thing, um, the killing of men is going to be just as arbitrary and just as prevalent. So, the BBC doc documentary reporter interviewed... Uh, a Congolese man whose family was attacked by uniformed men in 2008. He was bound hand and foot and beaten for three hours, uh, during which he watched as they killed his entire family, including his two children, before cutting off their heads. Then uh, they left him for dead. In 2010, he was attacked again by men in uniform. He believes they targeted him specifically after discovering he was still alive after the first assault. They, uh, they took him, uh, they bound him and blindfolded him, uh, drove him in a van to a barracks uh, where there were other prisoners. While there, he was sexually tortured and raped for a period of four or five days. He, uh, he says he was semi-conscious uh, for most of it, um, sort of in a dissociative state. Then they loaded him into a van and drove him out into the bush and raped him again. And at that point, he asked them to kill him. And they, he says they just laughed and left him lying there. When a passing car came across him, he asked them to drive him to Kimpala, Uganda, where he was interviewed. Um, this is a, a place where thousands of displaced people from DRC seek refuge. 
Other male victims interviewed uh, and examined have been forcibly circumcised, raped with objects like screwdrivers, castrated, um, even had their genitalia completely amputated. Unlike the woman Eve Endler spoke of, there's, there's really no heartwarming story of, uh, of healing and triumph for any of these guys to share. Uh, not one surgery, let alone nine. No city of joy built for them and furnished with computers provided by Google where they can heal and learn and be trained and uh, get back on their feet. Um, no charity uh, that deals with their problems. In fact, when interviewed, uh, this man said that his injuries are not healed uh, and, and that he would rather die than live. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, 22% of all men in the Congo, compared with 30% of women, have experienced sexual, sexual violence as a weapon of war. When you consider the higher rates of uh, general victimization of non-combatant men and boys in conflicts like the one in the Congo, uh, where it, it's at least two to one, and their higher mortality rate, um, I, I really don't know that these numbers are 100% accurate. Uh, it really can't be determined by surveys like that um, whether men who were killed experienced sexual violence before their deaths. Um, so The men who do survive almost never speak of their experiences to anyone. Uh, under the law, they are guilty of a crime, uh, the crime of homosexuality. Uh, they are as guilty as the perpetrator, and they can face punishments just as severe. Um, they don't typically disclose to family due to justifiable fears of abandonment. Uh, one employee of the Refugee Law Project uh, says it's common for a woman upon discovering that her husband has been raped to pack up the children and leave him. Is this a woman? Is it a man? If he can be raped, who is protecting me? According to Dr. Lynn Lawry of Harvard Medical School, one of the authors of the uh, JAMA study, um, reaction within the academic, political, and humanitarian communities to that study on male rape in the Congo has ranged from shock to puzzlement to controversy to anger. She really wasn't prepared for the level of hostility to their findings on the part of humanitarian NGOs. Uh, not anger on behalf of male victims, but anger over the public being made aware of them. Dr. Lowry herself was shocked not just by the prevalence of male rape in the Congo, but at the level of female perpetration. Some 40% of the sexual violence against women in the Congo and 10% of that against men was perpetrated by women. Those findings defy the cultural narrative, both that of patriarchy and of feminism. The UN, the law, traditionalism, and feminism all view rape as something that only impacts women and girls, and something that is only perpetrated by men. According to Lara Stemple of the University of California's Health and Human Rights Project, out of more than 4,000 NGOs in reviewed, only 3% even mentioned the experience of male victims, and none did so as more than a passing reference. I, uh, I have to wonder if any of those NGOs mention female perpetrators at all. And while Dr. Lowry sees the resistance of NGOs and others to address male rape victims uh, as originating in a fear that resources will be diverted from their chosen issue, that essentially male victims will take too big a piece of a finite pie, I think it is deeper and more complicated than that. This is about our views of gender. Feminist activism did bring the issue of rape into the focus of human rights bodies in the 80s and 90s, but they weren't telling us anything we didn't already think we knew. Our ideas of rape, in whatever context it occurs, have always existed within a male perpetrator-female victim model. 
Rape of women has always been acknowledged as a weapon of war and political advantage, a means to demoralize the enemy and destroy communities. Propaganda during the early decades of the last century clearly demonstrates that rape was a pervasive enough fear to be exploited, uh, either to convince men to enlist or to demonize the opposition. In her speech, Eve Ensler calls rape femicide, a systematic method of destroying women. And uh, while I would agree that rape of women is just, it's a horrible thing, um, rape is not restricted to female victims. The systematic rape of women undermines their relationships and community. The systematic rape of men annihilates everything we believe about what men are and should be, and completely uproots them from their roles in family and community. In a traditional society, male rape tells people that anyone can be abused in this way, and that those who have always been seen as the protectors of women and children can no longer be depended on in that way, that the defenders of everyone can't even defend themselves. A woman who's been raped is a damaged woman, but she's still a woman. A man who's been raped is no longer a man. And Eve Ensler claims that women's bodies are the landscape upon which all of human conflict and avarice is fought. But she can only believe that by holding her nose and closing her eyes as she marches through the Congo over a pile of male bodies. Men upon whom similar terrors are wreaked, but who are silent. The silence of death or the silence of social isolation. She talks about hundreds of thousands of women and girls. Two-year-olds raped to death, women who are incontinent, leaking urine and feces through their wounds, the walking wounded riddled with, riddled with infection and racked with pain. 30% of women in the Congo. But no mention from Eve Ensler of the 22% of men, hundreds of thousands, who suffered the exact same things without voices and without help or healing. Feminist theorists were preaching to the misinformed choir when they portrayed rape as, at best, a byproduct and, at worst, the primary motive of traditional social organization and male sexuality and cast women as the sole victims of this form of toxic masculinity and male predation that exists only to subjugate women. That there was anyone in academia, the law, or wider society who believed feminist ideas about rape were revolutionary or novel or groundbreaking remains, to me, one of the biggest mysteries out there. It's the same bullshit people have always believed, and it's just as misguided. But that's the thing. Feminist theory in this area, in most areas, dovetails perfectly with our instinctive perceptions and expectations of gender and traditional cultural and sociological memes that cast men as moral agents, capable only of performing good and evil, and women as moral patients or objects, capable only of absorbing good or evil. Feminist thought concerning sexual violence was never innovative. It's always been the same shit, different pile. Still, when you think about how the validity of feminist theory depends on the validity of these theoretical models of rape, uh, just like theoretical models of domestic violence, as their supporting evidence. It's pretty clear why someone like Eve Ensler would be resistant to even acknowledging the existence of male victims and uh, female perpetrators of sexual violence. Uh, this will be true especially of wartime sexual violence, since everyone especially those feminists, views bloody conflict as a solely male domain. And while this view is certainly not just a problem with feminism, after all, it wasn't feminism that passed laws in the Congo that punished the victim of a male rape as harshly as the perpetrator, feminist theory seems completely inadequate uh, to address any human phenomenon outside of the lens of male agent and female object. Ensler's speech at the NOW conference just hammered that nail home for me. 
addressing the gathered women as vaginas and the male audience members as vagina-friendly men was freaky enough. Referring to men as men and to women as body parts? But when she spoke of what's going on in the Congo, her every word reinforced the idea that men act and women are acted upon, that the sum of a woman is only what is done to or for her, and the sum of a man is only what he does to or for others. What are men to Eve Ensler? They're the evil white Westerners out to rape Africa of its resources. They are the evil militants who brutalize and murder innocent villagers. They are the unwilling tools of those evil men, forced at gunpoint to rape their mothers and daughters, but not to be mentioned again. They're the doctors performing the life-saving surgery that saved that poor woman, and the people who built the safe village where these women and girls could escape sexual violence, the guards who undoubtedly marched the perimeter of that village, the people who supplied them with computers, internet, and a shot at an education. The only mention of male victims in her entire speech was still framed in the context of perpetration. A father forced to rape his daughter, or a son to rape his mother. Once she was done conveying what they did, it was like they no longer existed to her. The men are the doers in Eve Ensler's narrative. The women are merely done to or done for. And how the fuck is that challenging our gendered views on anything? How are Eve Ensler and her ilk going to overthrow patriarchy when all they ever seem to do is preach it? And how will anything ever change when the people who are supposedly defying the status quo are only entrenching it ever deeper? Feminism is the privileged voice on gender issues and it's as silent about the suffering of sexually victimized men and the actions of female rapists in the Congo as the staunchest tradcon, because feminism's entire body of work rests on the necessity of those men and those women not existing. At present, there are no agencies providing funding to male victims of rape in the Congo. Dutch Oxfam has even gone so far as to threaten to pull funding if too much is spent on the few male victims who do seek assistance. Other human rights advocates, few in number, complain that the focus of the UN and the media on women as a monolithic victim class and men as a monolithic perpetrator class undermines not only their efforts in helping and protecting male victims, but in bringing female perpetrators of human rights violations to justice. And violate human rights, women definitely do. When Adam Jones examined the activities of five of the female architects of the Rwandan genocide, he noted they not only participated in selecting thousands of Tutsi men and boys to be killed, they were often the ones right in there delivering death. According to author Tim Goldich, quote, these cases of female leaders represent only a small part of the story of women's participation in the genocide. At the grassroots, very often, Groups of women ululated their men into the action that would result in the deaths of thousands of innocent men, women, and children, many of them their own neighbors. Their role was dominant in the post-massacre looting and stripping of bodies, which often involved climbing over corpses and those still alive and moaning in agony, piled thigh-high in the confined spaces in which many Tutsis met their end. Frequently, these women assisted in administering the, t the coup de grace to those clinging to life. If Eve Ensler thinks that women are uniquely equipped to lead without descending into violence, she needs to open her eyes. The model with which we as humans view gender makes us so reluctant to not only feel any kind of compassion for male victims of crime, hardship, and suffering, but also to deliver any kind of accountability to women who do horrible things. Just like Taslima Nareen's childish narrative men throw acid on us, but women still love men, ignores the 30% of acid attack victims who are men and boys, and the significant number of perpetrators who are women. Eve Ensler's tale of Jeanne from the Congo ignores a very great deal of suffering and marginalization, simply because, in her mind, all women are victims, and that is all they are. And all a man is, is how he affects women. And I'm sorry, 
But Eve Ensler, in her call for women to rise up, a billion of them worldwide next February 14th, to represent the one out of three women globally who will be raped or beaten in their lifetimes, she's been thinking with her vagina. Because I'm almost positive she never even thought to ask the question, how many men will be raped or beaten in their lifetimes for comparison? If she had, I wonder if she'd like or even care about the answer. She really doesn't get the idea that humans, men and women, are in this together, and that the warp and weft created by our equilibrium is what society is built on. To her, men exist only to help or to harm women. And that means a man who's been raped is of no consequence to anyone, least of all her. She's as big a slave to her hominid programming and traditional views of gender as anybody else. A slave to the idea that men do what women are done. And while she noted that since spending time in the Congo, she's become fully radicalized. Becoming a radical proponent of the status quo doesn't make her any more special than Rush Limbaugh. And I think the most cynical and stomach-turning part of the entire speech was the way she drew equivalence between the suffering of a woman in the Congo, a woman like Jean, in a, in a place where there is a war on everyone, and the suffering of women in the West who are denied free birth control. To her, it's all one big war on women, don't you know? And the men, if they're not harming women or being useful to women, they don't exist at all. That is my impression of uh, my experiences at the NOW conference. Uh, Eve Ensler's speech was just the, the most uh, obvious of, of, and the only one that managed to get caught on tape that I have. And, uh, yeah, it, it just seemed to be an exercise in vagina gazing, gynocentrism. Uh, nothing exists to these women but, but women. Everything else only exists in relation to women. And I... Anyhow, I have a mess to clean up in my kitchen. And I have some weeds to poison out in the yard. So I am going to leave it at that. And hopefully the next video will not leave you waiting quite so long. So I will see you all later.